but I want to do two things before we get into that. Number one, I want to talk, I want to review a couple of things that we sort of wrapped up at the end of class on Wednesday. <clears throat> Number two, I'm going to go over your next assignment. And then we'll go over try catches. <clears throat> the two things that we went over last time were casting and boxing. Sounds like it's a sports show here. Both of these relate to data types. All right. Um, casting is where you tell Java to treat something as a similar but different data type or class. Um, Typically, we're going to talk about casting a superclass to a subclass. You really, I'm trying to think of a case. You don't really need to ever cast a subclass as a superclass because a subclass already is a member of the superclass. There's really no need in doing that. I suppose you do that. I suppose you cast it when you do something like this. You say pizza p equals new sheet pizza. You're creating a sheet pizza object, but you're telling it to treat it like a pizza. So that's sort of like casting, in that it's one object, and you're telling it to treat it uh, it's, it's a member of one class, and you're telling it to treat it as a member of another class. And again, the downside of that is we can't call any functions that don't exist on the pizza class. So if any functions exist on the subclass, we're not able to call those. On the other hand, if I do something like this, if I did something like this, This is what's known as casting. I'm telling it, create a sheet pizza called x and set it equal to the sheet pizza, casting p to a sheet pizza object. That's legit, provided that p really is a sheet pizza object. So assuming that these are two successive statements in our code, that would be legit. If, however, p got set to some other kind of pizza, a regular pizza, somewhere in the middle here, <clears throat> this would be invalid and would cause an error. And it would get, generate a runtime error, because a compiler can't tell whether something is a member of that class or not until you actually go and run it. Especially, again, remembering that um, scenarios are going to be much trickier than this. You know, I'm writing this as just three or four lines consecutively in a program, where you're never going to write code that looks like this. This is just an example to illustrate. So casting is where you tell something, an object that's a member of a class, to be treated as another, as an object that's a member of another class. And that's OK, provided that it really is a member of that class. All right. So if it's a sheet pizza object, I can cast a pizza object to a sheet pizza object, provided that the pizza object contained a sheet pizza object. If it didn't, then I would get an error, and I would get that error at runtime. The other thing that we talked about is um, how a lot of primitives have a wrapper class, integer double. And you can tell the wrapper class because it's capitalized, as all classes are, and it's usually like the full name. And they're associated with primitives. You know, an integer is related to an int, a double is related to a double, a boolean is related to a boolean. So 
This would be a great question on a test. What's the difference between Boolean capital B and Boolean with a lowercase b? And the answer to that is a Boolean with a lowercase b is a primitive, or the capital B is the wrapper class. What boxing is is the ability to go between these classes seamlessly. So if I have an integer, x equals 2, and I have an integer, y, I can say y equals x, all right, without doing any kind of casting or converting. The compiler takes it for me because int and integer are related. Integer is the wrapper class around an int. So inside of the integer class, there's an int property. And so I can say that, all right. I can compare them. And if you remember last time, the only, thing, the only time you run into trouble is if you compare two integers, capital I, two of the wrapper classes, because then it will compare them as objects and not the value of the integers. And again, if you compare them as an object, you're comparing the pointer, not the value of that integer. All right, so that's the idea. That's boxing. All right, and it happens automatically, and it really is just to save you from sort of going crazy. Uh, and doing all these little conversions. Um, these are especially needed because certain classes like array lists only work with objects. So we can't make an array list. Array list is a really handy thing, all right? But we can't work with an array list um, to store primitives. So we have to store objects. So what if we want to store an array list of uh, primitives? Well, then we use a, uh, um, uh, an integer, the wrapper class, and then we can treat it as though it's an object. All right, so keep those, those, those two things in mind because they're relevant to our example. Because I think I do a little bit of casting, and there's a little bit of uh, um, boxing in, in these examples. All right, so on to your next assignment, which deals with interfaces. It's actually hard creating interfaces. Um, it, it's not hard to create them. It's hard to think of problems for interfaces. Um, so I came up with one that I think is good. Um, in real projects, in real in-depth projects, it's not really that hard to come up with them. But just to teach the basic concept of them, some of the interfaces that you actually use in a real world are a little bit con uh, uh, complex. So in this case, um, I want to come up with a simple one. And what I came up with was this. I came up with two classes, a driver, and an automobile. And I know my screen is wrong already. Driver and an automobile. Now there's no inheritance, inheritance between these, right? In other words, a driver is not an automobile, and an automobile isn't a driver. All right? So one, we can't inherit one from the other. Um, in addition, we'd really be stretching it if we tried to think of a super class um, that contain both of these, right? Because, you know, there's really nothing that we could say a driver, there's not a lot that we can say that a driver and an automobile have in common, right? In terms of code and so on. But they do have one thing in common. What do they have in common? What does a driver and an automobile have in common? One uses the other, that's true. It's not really what they have in common. They both go the same place, hopefully. Uh, yes? They're both part of the driving experience. That's true. The one behavior that they have in common is that they have licenses. All right, that's what I was looking for. I know, I should just say what I'm looking for instead of trying to, like, trying to make you guys guess. But sometimes it's fun, all right? Um, they both have licenses. And we could even extend this, right? Could you imagine if we were a, um, who is, uh, who are the people, the license bureau or whatever, the registrar or whoever handles this? Um, 
th they deal with a lot of different licenses. And I don't know if all of them go from the, through the same place. But I mean, if you think about it, there's licenses on bicycles. There are um, hunting licenses, uh, fishing licenses, marriage licenses, doctor licenses, nurses licenses, uh, licensed therapists, licensed a lot of things. Software is licensed, all right? So therefore, if your problem contained these things, it would be reasonable to create an interface for licensed, that these things are licensed, all right? Because a driver is a licensed thing. A driver is a kind of licensed thing. A automobile is a kind of a licensed thing, all right? Software is a kind of a licensed thing, and so on. All right, so you're going to create an interface. So these two don't inherit from each other, but they do share in common an interface called licensed. Again, we usually show this with a dotted line. And I was originally going to contain a few, a few other things like software and whatever, but for our problem, I decided just to go with these two things. Now, for this assignment, you know, you obviously could, could do a lot of stuff for this assignment. You could obviously put a lot of attributes in here, but for our purpose, there's a few that I'm especially interested in, and you can add some if you, if you want to. The licensed interface should have the following methods. So the following methods should be in the licensed interface is expired, and that accepts a date argument. Get full license number. And finally, get special conditions. If you think about it, those are maybe three things that we would think about that, that almost any licensed item would have. For example, if you're talking about licensing software, what are the special conditions? Well, maybe it's licensed to run on one CPU uh, or two CPU, one CPU and a backup, or um, you have a license for 10 computers within your organization, or it's licensed within the United States, or whatever, all right? So these are three things that I've defined need to be in the licensed interface. If it's expired or not, the full license number, and any special conditions. So that's going to be in your licensed interface. Both of these two classes are going to implement the licensed interface, automobile and driver. Automobile should have these attributes at least these attributes. If you want to add other things in there, like the make and model of the car, the color of the car, likewise with driver, the name of the driver, and so on. You should have these attributes. String attributes will be a state and a license number. Local date will be the date that the license was issued, the date that you got the license plate. And a Boolean for is it an extended license? Because Again, I don't know if this is true in every state, but I tried to make this at least a little bit realistic as far as Ohio goes, all right? You actually uh, can renew your license for two years, I think, at a time, if you want, I think, all right? Uh, I kind of remember seeing that as an option. If not, we're going to pretend that you can, all right? Okay, thanks. I, th I didn't think I was losing my mind, at least not about, not about that. A driver should have these, also a state and a license number should have a date for the date expired. Notice that's different than the date issued. All right? The date issued is on the car. The date expired is going to be an attribute of the person, the driver. Then you're going to have two Booleans, whether it's a chauffeur's license and is visual correction required. So if you, I think if you pass a special test, you can be put down as a chauffeur's, having a chauffeur's license. Um, we're going to pretend that's just a feature of a regular license. I don't know if it really is or not. But definitely on a license, there are special conditions that say that I, for example, have to be wearing my glasses. All right? Maybe other people don't have that restriction if you don't wear glasses. Now, let's keep in mind why I'm doing this and why I did these things in different ways. I gave 
the automobile and the driver different restrictions because first of all there's different restrictions on there's different special conditions rather for these kinds of licenses in the real world all right but secondly I want to illustrate that we could create an interface without knowing the details it's the job of each class to implement it correctly so for example we have to implement the is expired method well for an automobile We'll look to see, first of all, when it was renewed last, when, or, I'm sorry, not when it was renewed, when it was issued. And then we'll look to see, is it an extended license or not? If it's extended, we'll figure out two years after when it was issued. If it's not extended, then we'll figure one year after it's issued. Then we'll compare the date that it expires with the date that the argument was given, and we'll say if it's expired or not. All right. Now the driver has a totally different implementation. You don't have the option of having a two-year driver's license or whatever. It's due, it's renewed every however often, but we don't even really need to need that because the attributes is the date expired. So in there, we the, the attribute that we have for the driver's class is date expired. So we simply compare the date with the date expired. So for the car, we have to do some calculations and some comparisons. For the, for the driver, we simply look to see if it's expired or not. All right, here's how we implement these. Automobile, is it expired? If the argument is one year after date issued, or if it's two years if extended is true. For a driver, we simply see if the argument is after the date that it was expired. The full license number is going to be the state dash license number, right? Because whatever your license is, there might be someone in Michigan that has the same license number as you or your car. So for both of them, the full license number is going to be the state, a dash, and your license number. For the automobile, if, if, if extended is true, then return a message that says this has an extended plate. All right, which means it's good for two years. Otherwise, return no special conditions. If it's a driver, it should display a message based on the chauffeur and visual correction attributes. So if the chauffeur's license is set to be true and the visual correction is set to be false, it will say, under special conditions, this is a chauffeur's license. If both of them are true, it will say, chauffeur's license, visual correction needed. If neither of them are true, I guess it will just say no special conditions, just like the other one did. All right? So that's the specifics of how we implement those functions for those classes. How are you going to test this? Well, your unit test class should create an array list of objects that implement the licensed interface. Loop through them, display the full license number if the license is expired, and using the current date uh, to determine if it's expired or not and display any special conditions. So you'll just have license A, B, C, D, expired, no, special conditions, chauffeur's license. D, E, F, G, yes, it's expired, special conditions, it was on a two-year uh, extended renewal. Okay. Any questions about what you need for this? You can see how we could easily apply this to, um, to um, different things. We could, for example, and again, we're not doing this in this case, but just so you understand the use of interfaces, we could actually make something like a temporary We could make a driver's class and maybe make a licensed driver's class and a temporary driver's class for people that have temporary permits. And we could implement the interface up here. Make this an abstract class, let's say, and then the special conditions would be different for a licensed driver versus a person with a temp. For a person with a temp, um, no matter what the other restrictions are, um, 
we would say um, must be with a fully licensed driver or something like that. All right, whatever the restrictions on a temporary license are. I wish I'd have thought of this last night when I was making this assignment. I would have added that in. But if you want to, go ahead and add it in. But it's not a requirement. Okay, questions about this? All right, on to try catches. How many of you have used try catches before in one class or another? So you have all caught exceptions. How many of you have thrown exceptions in the code? Okay. Some of you have, some of you haven't. Okay. That's the two ends of the, the deal, throwing exceptions and catching exceptions. When you use the exceptions, when you catch exceptions, um, you're talking about uh, a problem that comes up. An exception is an exceptional circumstance. Uh, in a nutshell, it's a problem that comes up. And the rule about this is someone has to take care of this problem. And the choices are you or the Java virtual machine. All right? If you let the Java virtual machine take care of it, it's going to take care of it how? How does the Java virtual machine handle exceptions? It's going to blow it up, right? It's going to stop the program. You're going to get an error, and it's going to say something ugly. All right? You can choose to handle exceptions however you want. Uh, exception handling is especially good if you can actually do something about it. For example, if you have a GUI where you could display a message that says, hey, you entered a wrong value, can you please re-enter it? All right? Uh, even in batch processing, though, where you, where you loop through maybe data from a database and do something over and over again, you might be able to do something like, for example, log information saying that there was a problem. So that way, if there was a thousand pieces of information that needed process, one wouldn't blow it up. It would simply log the information and go on to the next one. So exception is handling any sort of exceptional case, or again, we usually think of them as being error cases. Um, let me download a real simple example used to demonstrate an exception. We're not going to handle the exception yet. I just want to see a couple examples of exceptions. All right, let's look at the code here. Then we'll run it and we'll actually see the exception. All right, first of all, I have, this is where the boxing comes in. I want to make an array list. Notice, and again, I, I cheated a little bit to make it easier to generate exceptions. I didn't declare my array list as having any particular kind of object. Normally, we declare our array list like this. Something like that, where we can only put in things of that type of object. But I just declare, declare my array list like that. What does that mean when you do that? It means any object under the sun can be put in that array list. OK, so I create my array list. I create an int called i. I create an integer called ii. I set i equal to 3. I say i i equal i. So effectively what I've done is I've made, I've boxed i into an integer object. I create a string called s. I add that to, I add the i i to that. I loop through then and I square the value in the array list and I say that I, I squared equals 
I I. Oh, I should I should. Why am I so cheap with variables? So I I squared equals the value of J. So let's run this. We're going to run this and not get any error. Okay. So let me go here and compile it. I don't get an error, I get a warning. And I do get an error. Oh, variable j is already defined. No, oh, I'm using it there. I don't get any errors, but I get a warning. This is, this is in literary, literary world, this would be foreshadowing. It, Java compiler knows there's something funny going on. And let's see what it's warning us about. It's warning us about this line right here. So if it looks at, um, I don't know if it says specifically where it is. Oh, you can compile with XLINT for details. It's warning us all different kinds of things. It's warning us that number one, we're not declaring our array list to contain anything anything special. So it knows that that is likely for problems. And because of that, it's concerned that we can put in anything we want to into that array list. So it's essentially warning you what I've already told you. By declaring this array list as simply a plain old array list, we're not controlling what goes in there. Therefore, we can put any object in there. So OK, yeah, we know that. All right, what statement could go bad? this statement could go bad because C, the array list, contains any old object. And I'm casting that object as an integer. All right? Now, if the object really is an integer, it's not a problem. It'll go and do its thing. So I create my integer object. I give it a value of 3. I add that integer object to my array list. I then pull that element out of the array list cast it as an integer, it's already an integer, that's great. And therefore, as this is written now, this will compile. Not just compile, but it will run without any error. So let me go here and let me run this. And it tells me 3 squared equals 9. So it ran without a problem. Why? Because I knew that there was an integer put in there, and then I cast it as an integer. Well, the problem is, though, is if we're not careful, we could try putting other stuff in there that isn't an integer object. So what I have commented out, I'm going to uncomment one at a time. The first one says C add S. So I'm going to add a string that simply says hi. What is hi squared? Hi, hi? No. All right. It's an error, right? Because I can't take and square the word hi. Specifically, where will the error happen? The error will happen in line 19. Because I'm going to try to cast this string object as an integer, and that's where it's going to blow up. All right, that's where it's going to blow up. Because the second object that we add isn't an integer. So if I say treat it like an integer, which is, again, what casting is saying, can't treat a string like an integer. can treat an integer like an integer. It can't treat 
a string like an integer. All right. It actually compiles cleanly, even though it's obvious to us that this is going to blow up. Why? Well, the compiler can't see ahead far enough to know, to realize that at the time this loop runs, there's a string and a, or there's an integer uh, object and a string object in that array list. So it's not able to sort of piece that together. All it knows is, hey, they're going to try to cast this as an integer, and okay, I'll try to do that. And I'll either be able to do that or not be able to do it. Well, in this case, when I run it, first time it worked, right, because I was able to take that object, cast it as an integer, because it was an integer, then square it, and output that. The second time through the loop, a string cannot be cast to an integer. So line 19 blows up. And it blows up with a specific kind of error. Java Lang class cast exception. You get that error because you said that I want to treat this object like an integer, and yet it was a string. Can't do that. So you get an error. Let's, uh, let's recomment that line and uncomment this line out. I'm adding a null object to this. What's a null pointer? A null pointer points to nothing. All right. So there's no object at the other end of the pointer. Well, that doesn't sound good, right? If there's no object at the other end of the pointer, there can't possibly be an integer at the other end of the pointer, all right? If there's nothing at the other end of the pointer. So we're going to get an exception but we're going to get a different kind of exception. Again, the Java compiler doesn't have the foresight to see that, hey, there's trouble coming. But when we go to run this, we get an error, the same, almost the same point, all right, because we have a, uh, but it's a different kind of error. It's a null pointer exception. This is a big exception that, that um, especially when you're learning object-oriented programming and you're learning Java, this is one that you're going to get a lot. And this is one that you always have to be aware of and, be te and to test for, all right? Because uh, what that's saying is that you're trying to do something to an object, but that object pointer doesn't point to anything, all right? Um, Will be another example of an ob of a of a null object pointer if I was able to do something like this. If I said pizza p, boom, and I don't say equals new pizza, and I don't do anything. Finally, I call a function somewhere pizza get cost. It's going to blow up because it can't, you know, a non-existent pizza doesn't have any costs associated with it. It's not a cost of zero. There just is no formula to calculate the cost of a pizza that doesn't exist. So therefore, that's going to give me an error and it's going to give me a null object reference. Okay. So the thing to summarize for this is we have two potential issues in this code, at least two, all right? One of them is where we have a null object. This isn't smart enough to know to look for a null object, all right? It's not smart enough to look for a null object. Therefore, it tries to do everything with a null object, and it ends up not being able to do it because it's, it's a null object. The other thing is if we give it an object other than an integer, all right? Uh, if we give it an object other than an integer, like adding a string to the array list, and we loop through it, the second time through we get the string, the cast isn't able to happen. So our two problems are we have a null object or we have an object that is not an integer. Now, the right way to fix this would be to do this, right? <clears throat> 
but this is the way that I chose to demonstrate exceptions. So I intentionally left that out. The nice thing about doing this, I'm pointing on the screen like you can see, the nice thing of doing this is this, the, the compiler then knows if you try to put something in that's not an integer. Always better to get compiler errors than runtime errors, right? Because compiler errors right in your face tells you when you go to compile it that this is not going to work. A runtime error, it will work sometimes and not work other times, depending on the circumstances that you come into. If your program encounters problematic circumstances, it will blow up. If your pro uh, program that particular day does not encounter pro uh, problematic circumstances, it'll go just fine. Those kind of sporadic errors are the ones that are especially difficult to debug because you know something that happens every single time should be easy to debug. Something that happens once in a while, well, then you have all these factors going on of what could uh, be influencing it. So let's see how to use a try-catch to fix this. So we should have the same class. We have the same code, but we have a try catch. And I'm going to indent this to make the code look cleaner. nice thing about editors like this is if you put your mouse next to one of the braces, it shows you the brace that belongs to it and so on. I also like to line these up. And you can line it up either like this or like this. doesn't really matter, whichever you think is easier. So how does the try-catch work? All right. The try-catch, someone explain to me how the try-catch works. I'm, I work too hard. I have to explain everything all the time. Why don't you guys do it for me? Yes. Okay, good description. Try this block of code. In other words, try and execute it. If an exception happens, so if there's a problem, some exceptional circumstances, some problematic conditions, it will go and do the things, it will follow down the line and do the things listed in the catches. Now, I'm going to start out by doing just this. I'm going to catch an exception. And that gives us an exception object. Remember, in Java, everything's an object. So even your errors are objects. So if this doesn't work for whatever reason, I get an object, and I can do something with it. And then the Java virtual machine doesn't have to deal with it. So the Java virtual machine doesn't blow up and cause the program not to work. So I'm going to go and I'm going to add, I'm going to create another integer here. So I'm going to add G also. So now there's three things in my, in my list. All right. Now I'm going to compile it and run it. Compiles cleanly, still get that warning. 
it's a little awkward the way this is. I'm going to make it a little smaller. I hope you can still read it. All right. Does the first one. It displays that the squared equals 9. And of try catch displays the exception. But since we handle the exception and not the Java virtual machine, we can continue on. We handle the exception by displaying a message. We could write to a log file. We could display something on the operator's console or whatever. But it continues to the last thing and gives, gives us a squared value of 484. So let's look at the code here. I have a finally. The finally happens whether there's an exception or not. So that's why at the end of every trip through the loop, it says end of catch. All right. So I put that in there because you might have some kind of code to wrap up. Whether there's a problem or not, do this. I'm going to get rid of that because it really just clutters it. Now, in this case, any exception I get gets caught by this. So any exception that gets generated through this code, regardless of the kind of exception, I'm going to go in and add the null object back in. So now we're going to have four things in our array list. The first and third are going to be legit data. The second and fourth are going to be error data. Notice it goes through all of them. And for the ones that are correct, it displays a correct. For the ones that are wrong, it displays that. Since we are trapping for errors, we have the same code that handles both exceptions. All right. All we're looking for is any error that gets thrown by this. So we had two different kinds of errors that were thrown. One was a null object exception. One was a cast exception. One, we tried to cast a string as an integer. The other, we tried to do something with a null object. However, the same line of code got executed. Why? Because we're only looking for the one kind of exception. All right? And this is one thing that's nice about exception trapping, is that we can fine tune our exception handling to the specific error that we get. All right. In this case, we do the same thing regardless of what kind of error is thrown. So this code gets a cast exception. It gets a no object exception. It throws that exception. This guy catches it and does its thing. All right. In this case, it's going to print out simply the words exception has occurred. And it's going to print out e get message. What is e get message? That's the actual problem. All right. Remember, when an exception is created, when an exception is thrown, an object is created. What kind of object is created? Well, it's an object of type exception. Now, it might be a null pointer exception or an illegal cast exception or whatever, but at its root, it is an exception. All right. We're saying anything of that class we're catching. So any problem under the sun that gets thrown, we're catching. And we're displaying one of the properties. We're calling a function on that exception object, e get message, that says more details about the actual problem that occurred. Let's look to see what attributes and methods are in existence for the Java exception object. 
get used to reading these Java docs. They're a little hard to read. They're not the way to learn Java, but they're a good reference if you want to know, well, what if I don't want to display the message? What other options I have? This will show you all the different things that all the different uh, things that exist on it. And it also shows you what is the subclass of. It's a subclass of something called throwable. And we have get message, which is what we're displaying. We have get stack trace. Let's put that one in instead. Doesn't necessarily, it doesn't give me exactly what I thought it would, but uh, it gives us some other information. But these are all the methods that exist on it, and we can see what inherits from this and what, um, what, what, objects this um, what methods come from its superclass and the constructors and all that so we get a good deal of information from these Java docs anyhow I'm going to put this back to get message we can use the exception to uh, we can use the exception to get message to get some information about the error that was occurred but we can also do better than that. We can fine tune our exception handling. Now, in this example, it's going to be less meaningful, but imagine, um, depending on the kind of exception, you might want to do different things on it, about it. In this one, we're really just displaying messages in both cases. But imagine in one case we would want to write to one log file, in another case we would want to write to another log file. Or maybe we display a message on the, uh, on the, uh, in the GUI if one exception occurs, and we write to a log file if another uh, exception occurs. What this is, is this allows me to handle this exception differently. So here I'm catching any problem. Here I'm catching this specific problem. So. When I try to cast the string as an integer and I get the class cast exception, this is the code that's going to execute. When I try to process the no object, it's not this kind of error, so this code won't execute, but it is some kind of exception. Exceptions are in a whole inheritance structure just like anything else. So this is kind of like a sieve. All right, is looking to catch the errors, and if it isn't of one type of error, it will try the next type of error, and it will try the next type of error and next type of error. So the last thing in all your catches should be a catch for just plain old exception, all right, because that is, even if we don't know the type of exception, you know, we can't anticipate the type of exception. We know if that code gets hit that there's some kind of problem and we can at least do something uh, about it. You typically know the kinds of problems that you're likely to get in code, especially when you gain more experience. Things like a null object reference is a big one that you want to test for. Things like the database not being able to connect to would be another great example of an exception that you could anticipate having. So you'd want to put catches for those errors that you think are most likely but you still want to have a catch-all at the end that if it's none of the errors that I expected, well, I still want to see about it. I still want to see information about the error that did occur. So in this case, with this added in, I'm going to get 
For the one error, I'm going to get this one. I'm going to get the message saying, handle this one differently. And for the null object reference, I'm going to get exception occurred. Okay, handle this one differently. So it does the first one and the third one still. This one, because it's that kind of exception, I can customize how I'm handling it. This one is not that kind of exception, but it's still some kind of exception. Therefore, the second catch catches it. So again, you typically know the exceptions that you expect. And in addition, there can be all kinds of exceptions that you don't expect. So you will typically write exception handlers for the things that you expect are likely, but we'll still have the catch-all at the end. Because if we were to leave this out, what's going to happen? Well, if we're not handling an exception, then the Java virtual machine would, would have to handle it, handle it. I don't think it'll give me a compile error. Let's see that real quick. Yeah, let's we do that. So I can choose only to handle the one kind of exception, but if another kind of exception occurs, then it's going to blow up. Because since I didn't handle it, the Java virtual machine has to handle it. All right. We'll continue this next time, and we will start looking like how we can use this within the sort of programs that we wrote. So for example, um, the pizza example. Um, maybe we can take that now and do the validation that we long said that we were going to do, so that if it's not um, SM or L for the size, we throw an exception. All right, see you up in lab.